The world's elite lined up to buy one of the fastest, most flamboyant cars of the 1930s, the Duesenberg. These cars were about romance and living life at the top. No other car compared to the Duesenberg. It was way ahead of its time. Some say it was the greatest car ever made in America. It was the ultimate classic. At the company's zenith, Duesenbergs were touted as the world's fastest production automobiles. Duesenberg was the shining star of the Auburn Accord Duesenberg company. These glamorous cars were built in a seemingly unlikely place, Auburn, Indiana. Duesenberg's Art Deco headquarters has been lovingly restored and transformed into one of the most beautiful auto museums in the world. It serves as a reminder of the car company's glory days, when the whole world knew that Duesenberg meant the best. These fabulous cars started out as the dreams of two young farmers from Iowa. They came to the United States as children in 1884 with their brothers, sisters, and widowed mother. The two boys, Fred and August, or Augie Duesenberg, discovered that farming on the frontiers in America was different than in Germany. Unlike Europe, there were vast, almost unlimited spaces that could be farmed. The only limit to what an individual could accomplish rested on their own abilities, not what they'd inherited. Harnessing the power of machines was the key to transforming this frontier. The Duesenberg brothers were inspired by the promise of farm machinery, not by farming. Each brother had a certain skill. Fred was adept at design and engineering, while Augie knew how to build and repair things. When the bicycle fad hit in the 1880s, the brothers decided to jump on board. They opened a shop and began to build and repair bicycles. Bicycles were fast, and they were both drawn by speed. Fred was an accomplished racer and held a speed record for 14 years. Augie also liked the racing scene. While bicycles were thrilling, a new mechanical wonder captured their attention, automobiles. They started out in 1902 by modifying a Marion automobile and racing it at a county fair in Iowa. Fred won, and the brothers' destiny was set. One year later, Fred had secured a job as a test driver for an upstart automaker, Rambler. Within two years, he and Augie were racing for Mason, owned by washing machine magnate, Senator Maytag. They were always hopping up the engines to make them go faster. This led to the development of their own engines. Next step, their own car. They entered two cars in the 1914 Indianapolis 500. Eddie Rickenbacker was at the wheel of one. He was a racer before he became a World War I flying ace. He didn't ace this race. The Duesenbergs finished 10th and 12th. Finishing was quite an accomplishment. Most of the cars didn't complete all 200 laps. The 
Duesenberg's 80 plus miles per hour performance was impressive. The brothers continued to use racing as a way to test their ideas. They pioneered overhead camshaft engines, superchargers, multiple valves per cylinder, and other innovations that increased horsepower. Unfortunately, by 1916, it was clear they couldn't make any money from racing. The solution? Build other products and use the profits to keep racing. The onset of World War I created demand for engineers and manufacturers. After winning a contract to build aircraft engines, the Duesenbergs moved to New York. They renovated an old factory in New Jersey and began to produce engines under license from Bugatti. Using a garage behind their home, they also went to work creating new engines for auto racing. This led to the development of the Duesenberg straight eight cylinder engine. It would serve as the platform for all their future engines. Running the factory provided them with the experience they'd need to launch a car company after the war. The Duesenbergs were drawn to the mecca of the automotive world, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They found investors in Indiana who shared their vision of a racing and passenger car company and relocated to Indianapolis. They built cars for the track, and in 1921, their first road car, the Model A, or the Duesenberg Straight 8. This advanced automobile offered the first mass-produced Straight 8 engine, and the first four-wheel hydraulic brakes produced in the United States. It was the fastest production car on the road at that time. Racing gave them the knowledge to create lightweight, high-revving, powerful cars with superior handling. Unfortunately, the cars weren't very stylish. But people like film star Rudolf Valentino were attracted to these fast, high-performance machines. As planned, the profits from the Model A allowed them to pursue racing. In 1921, they took a team of drivers to the French Grand Prix. They thought they were sunk when their number one driver, Jimmy Murphy, was hurt in a practice lap wreck. But he had the hospital tape him up and came back to the track to race. The determined Murphy piloted his powerful Duesenberg to victory. He was the first American to win a European Grand Prix. He came in far ahead of the second and third place French entries. The French team was so incensed by the foreign victor's win that they wouldn't acknowledge them at the race awards dinner. The unsung team took their trophy and went home. Ignored in France, they turned the win into an advertising campaign at home. They continued to rack up wins, including the 1924, 1925, and 1927 Indianapolis 500. While their racing wins kept them in the headlines, they weren't translating into profits. Their costs exceeded their revenue. And the car business wasn't providing the revenue stream they'd expected. After six years on the market, sales of the now outdated Model A had stalled at 650 cars. Fred and Augie needed money for a new model, but their investors had cleaned out the company and disappeared. 
Duesenberg slid into receivership. On October 26, 1926, the company was scooped up by E.L. Cord. He wanted to use the high-performance car as the foundation for a grand new company. Cord made his mark in the automobile business selling cars in Chicago. He believed he knew what the buyers wanted. He planned to combine Duesenberg with another Indiana car maker he'd overhauled, Auburn. Cord had taken 750 dowdy unsold Auburns, given them new splashy paint jobs, complete with pinstripes, and sold them. He reinvested the proceeds, transforming Auburn into an exciting and profitable company. The fast Auburn boat tail speedsters became icons, sought by Hollywood stars and wealthy young socialites. It wasn't a very practical car, but it was sexy. And when it flew by, it turned heads. With Auburn under his belt, Cord was confident that he could work the same magic with Duesenberg. Never short of hyperbole, he vowed to make it the best car in the world. He enlisted the help of Fred Duesenberg to create the biggest, fastest, most expensive car ever built. As work proceeded on the revamped Duesenberg, Cord instructed the engineers to develop a car named after himself. The first production car to offer front-wheel drive, the L29 Cord. He wanted a car line that would fill the price niche between Auburn and Duesenberg. But he wanted it to stand out too. Front-wheel drive allowed it to be lower than any other car on the road. It gave the Cord a sporty yet elegant look. The Marx Brothers and others flocked to this trend-setting car when it was introduced in 1929. But the Auburns and the L29s would be overshadowed by the Duesenbergs. The first Model J Duesenberg rolled out in 1928. Its high horsepower engine made it one of the fastest cars on the road. It was also expensive. In an era when a standard Ford cost $450, an average Duesenberg might cost $13,000 to $15,000. Buyers would usually order just an engine and rolling chassis from the factory. They'd turn this over to a custom bodybuilder to create the most flamboyant cars ever seen. These attention-getting cars spawned a term. It's a doozy. They were. When Wall Street crashed, Cord had to scramble to keep his over-the-top car company afloat. Selling Duesenbergs during the early dark days of the Depression was a challenge. But Cord was confident his cars would find buyers. With millions out of work, selling apples on street corners and living in shanties, there were people who thought buying such a car was in bad taste. But some of the ultra-rich didn't seem to care. They bought Duesenbergs. This select group made Duesenberg a top status symbol. Cord was so certain of his car's appeal, he didn't even show the product in advertising.
While kings, queens, princes, and the lords of the business world bought Duesenbergs, they also found fans among Hollywood royalty, the stars. Stars like Tyrone Power, Clark Gable, and Gary Cooper, as well as directors, producers, and other Hollywood luminaries, kept the company solvent. Gary Cooper and Clark Gable were set to race their Duesenberg Roadsters down Sunset Boulevard. This notoriety pumped up the Duesenberg image. Cord realized that star power was important for his company's continued health. He was an early believer in product placement. He made sure that his cars were available for photo shoots and would be seen in movies. Like today's marketers, he paid stars such as James Cagney a promotional fee to pose with the Duesenberg. Others like candy bar heiress Ethel Mars were happy to own a Duesenberg. She was joined by the Whitneys and chewing gum king P.K. Wrigley. These fast cars could be useful. Spain's King Alfonso was able to outrun Franco's henchmen when he fled the country in his powerful Duesenberg. Others, like one Maharaja who moved to the United States, just fell in love with driving his Duesenberg. He had a streamlined new roadster built to complement his new home. The most expensive Duesenberg ever produced was called the 20 Grand. This exquisite car was fitted with a custom body that cost about $12,000. It rode on the standard Duesenberg chassis that added another $8,500 to the total. At the time, $20,000 was an unheard of sum to pay. Today, this car is worth millions. Many of the custom Duesenbergs that were built have soared into the car auction price stratosphere. Like the original buyers, many Duesenberg collectors are fond of the supercharged models. The so-called SJs were capable of propelling these three-ton automobiles down the road at over 100 miles per hour. This speed made Duesenbergs one of the fastest production cars in the world. But while capable of escaping from the clutches of pursuing armies, these cars couldn't outrun the impact of the Depression. The sour economy eventually eroded the demand for custom coach-built high-end automobiles like the Duesenberg. Cord hatched a plan to keep his automotive empire alive. He started work on a brand new futuristic car, the Cord 810. A talented young stylist, Gordon Burig, was commissioned to come up with a modern design that would appeal to young people who wanted something fresh. Fred Duesenberg had died and Burig turned to Orgy to help him create a car that could save the company. The company was in dire straits and the team had very little research and development money. They had even less time. To demonstrate that they were still a viable business, they had to have a hundred cars ready for the 1935 New York Auto Show. This meant months of all-night work, often unpaid, to hand-build the cars in time. E.L. Cord didn't share his employees' hardships. 
he was holed up in England to avoid the grasp of the United States securities regulators. He'd been accused of stock manipulation. Some believe he invested a couple of million dollars in the Cord 810 project to demonstrate that the company was viable and so pump up the stock price. Once the stock had peaked, he would sell his shares and move on. We don't know if Burig was aware that he was a pawn in Cord's stock game, but if he was, he didn't let it get in the way. His front-wheel drive Cord 810 was hailed as an instant classic. People say it's perfectly proportioned. He'd made sure it looked good from any angle. The new Cord transformed the design of all automobiles. Taking the Cord's lead, radiator shells would disappear, as would running boards. Fenders would flow as an integral part of the body and not be a separate structure. This timeless design is considered to be one of the most important milestones in automotive styling. Gordon Burig called it rolling sculpture. Unfortunately, the car's stunning good looks couldn't keep the company afloat. By 1937, Auburn, Cord and Duesenberg had stopped building new cars. The last chassis were sold off and the factory closed. During the eight years Duesenberg was the king of automobiles, only 481 cars had been built. This was what Cord had promised to produce every year. Nearly 378 can still be accounted for, an indication of how valued these cars are today. But it wasn't until after World War II that most people recognized the importance of these cars. Today, collectors like Jay Leno have become devoted admirers of the powerful Duesenbergs. These are cars that constantly win prizes at the most prestigious collector car meets and fetch millions of dollars at auctions. A savvy collector could have snapped one up after the war for as little as $100. Classic cars by the mid-1950s, including Duesenberg's, started to gain favor with a few pioneer collectors. Restoring one of these cars was quite a challenge. Today, there are several experts, such as Randy Emer in California, who can help collectors with the difficult process of restoring a classic Duesenberg. Emer has a collection of original blueprints that allows him to rebuild nearly any part to factory specifications. This process isn't cheap, but the results are spectacular. The Auburn Cord Duesenberg Company disappeared, but the cars that resulted were timeless works of automotive art. These machines will thrill the world for years to come. Owners today know that they are just caretakers preserving beautiful works for future generations. These fabulous cars are a reminder of what can happen when dreams turn into reality.